Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don sitting in the host chair today and flying the What If Machine solo. Uh, Today we're going to look at something that's a little bit different than the quote-unquote serious historical topics that we look at. For those of you that listen to the show for a period of time, you know that every once in a while we like to look at something that is more in the vein of pop culture or is is not in the the vein of being... uh, you know, something that's caused by an assassination or a war. Sometimes the what-ifs in history that are fun to explore uh, may be impactful, uh, but are far less historically significant, and that's what we want to do today. So our topic today is going to center around a fork that actually goes back to American television history in the early 1990s. What we're going to center in on is May of 1992, and the question that we're going to ask today and explore the historical what-if of is what would have happened if when Johnny Carson departed The Tonight Show, David Letterman had taken over as the host of the show instead of Jay Leno. And we'll see that I think that that actually creates an interesting little spider web of possibilities uh, that are worth considering. And they do have cultural impact in the sense of uh, television is a cultural force not only in the United States but around the world. So I hope that you join us back after the break. We pick up the topic of what would have happened if David Letterman had become the host of The Tonight Show. See you in a bit. Taking a quick break from the podcast, here's Don. And Alexis. And we're going to talk to you once again about one of our favorite things. You've heard us talk about this before. It happens to be the way that Alexis and I do most of our reading, and we are both avid readers, Mm -hmm. but it's more effective to say these days I'm an avid listener because I don't read as much as I used to anymore. I don't like the strain on my eyes, and I don't like the, uh, the strange positions you have to cock your body in to turn pages of books, even digital books. And so I do most of my reading by being a story time adult and being read too. Mm-hmm. And I use Audible. So what's been your experience with Audible, Lex? I love Audible. And I love Audible because it is unabridged versions of books. I think that's an excellent point. Sometimes, particularly in the old days of books on tape, yeah, that dated me right there, even books on CDs, to do an unabridged version of particularly nonfiction, but fiction uh, was pretty bold. You'd have to have a lot of tapes or a lot of CDs. So now that things are in a uh, digital format, of course they have been for over a decade, One of the, I agree with you, one of the great things I love about Audible is these are not uh, excerpts from books, these are not abridged versions of books, these are unabridged versions of the source material. So it's limited to just a few types of topics, just a few types of genres, right Lex? Does that be no? Oh, the answer is no. So obviously we deal with alternate history, so you can find real history. Yes, which I've done before. Right. You can find alternate history. So, you know, Philip Dick, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, Harry Toadlove, mm-hmm. some of the others that we've often mentioned on the podcast, many of their books can be found in audible format. But it's not just books. No. What else is there? Podcast, theatrical productions, tons of different mediums on audible. Yeah. In addition to that, there are daily reads of things like the Wall Street Journal yep. periodicals. So it's an excellent place. Just whatever you would like to do and consume that in an audio format, Audible is the place to do it. So one of the things we've arranged uh, for our Fork and Time listeners is uh, we've arranged for you to have a free trial. Try it before you buy it. So how does that work, Lex? So if you go to the link in our show notes, or if you want to go directly to it, you want to go to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time. That's where you want to go. And doing that will benefit us, but also you'll be able to get a free month of Audible and an audio download as well. Right. And so the other neat thing about that is because Audible is affiliated with Amazon is if you happen to be a Prime member taking advantage of the one month free offer uh, that we provide and again we get the credit for that. You could you by the way you could get that offer other ways, but we'd like for you to do that through us. Doesn't cost you any more to do that so you can help us while you're helping yourself, but you actually get two credits to use during that first month. And two credits to use, period, if you get onto a subscription plan. And a credit normally is equivalent to a book or to an audio production. So, again, a fully unabridged book 
uh, is covered by one credit. Exactly. Uh, but you're limited to the types of devices you can listen on, right? Uh, no. So you what? Can... What are phones, some examples? Phones, iPhone, Android, uh, iPads, just your regular laptop or desktop computer. I mean. Yeah, you're not limited in any way with Audible. Yeah, and although I don't do it personally, but I know I know people who do this, if you have Amazon's smart speaker configuration, you can actually even listen to um, um, Audible programs there. It will remember where you are, so you can listen at home through the smart speaker, get into your car, listen through your smartphone that's connected. You can, you can really just follow along and make it a seamless experience wherever you go. Yep. So we invite you to help the show, help yourself, and go check out Audible. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Again, Don sitting in the host chair today. And as we set up before we went to the break, our topic today is going to be a popular culture topic. Uh, trying to keep things a little bit lighter here. We're going to be looking at the historical what if of what if David Letterman had actually taken over directly as the host of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson's departure in 1992. Uh, this is actually, I think, an interesting topic. There's actually uh, was a, uh, a made-for-television or made-for-cable movie uh, based on a book called The Late Shift, uh, which talks about all of the machinations and political, um, uh, network political intrigue, in terms of television intrigue politically, that went on around... Uh, following Johnny Carson's announcement of his retirement in 1991, and ultimately the hosting duties for The Tonight Show being given to Jay Leno, who had been a frequent guest host on the show and took over the responsibilities after Carson's retirement. Um, for those of you that know the story or are old enough to remember it firsthand, uh, this was an interesting thing because many had assumed for a long period of time uh, that David Letterman, who was at that time the host of the show that came on on NBC after The Tonight Show, uh, that would be Late Night with Late Night with David Letterman, was presumed to be essentially Carson's heir after Carson came to the end of his 30-plus year run as the host of The Tonight Show and really defining that format, the late night talk show format in the United States in so many ways that even continues down to today. And so there was the interesting... the story of what went on in terms of the battle of who would be the replacement and then what happened subsequently as a result of that. So today on the podcast I'd like to look at what the potential implications would have been on that particular genre and on on late night television in the United States if Letterman had in fact directly taken over from Leno which is what many had presumed would actually happen. To really understand the reason that this is even significant really is to needing to go back and understand what the landscape was of late night talk shows in the United States as they go historically back. And the fact that The Tonight Show was not only the predominant late night talk show, but actually that NBC had owned that particular space as a network for quite a while. Going all the way back to The Tonight Show when it was hosted by Jack Parr, later taken over by Carson, moved to the West Coast, it became a almost required viewing for a lot of adult Americans, particularly in the, the 70s and into the early 80s, uh, following the late local news in their particular markets. And in fact, it had an impact on, in many cases, which uh, news channel, or which news broadcast would be watched in local networks because folks wanted to be able to easily transition over. And even if they didn't watch the entire Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, to catch his monologue and perhaps the opening segment of the show. And so uh, while Carson had sort of built that into a unique television format, it was again the predominant uh, late night talk show in the United States, uh, even up until uh, Carson's retirement. It's not that there hadn't been other forays into that. Uh, there had been an effort by the other major networks, at least one of the major networks in terms of CBS, uh, to actually create a rival show. Uh, some of you may or may not remember that Pat Sajak, the longtime host of Wheel of Fortune, actually uh, had a show there. They tried to launch that. That was in the, in the 80s, and it just didn't quite uh, ever catch hold. There were other efforts. Uh, uh, Joan Rivers had an effort. There were efforts uh, that had some success, a little bit in syndication, and then there was also uh, some of the efforts by the, the new Fox network as it was coming into being uh, to try to move into that space. 
But as we arrive in 1991, when Carson made the announcement, sort of a surprise announcement, caught NBC a little bit off guard in May of 1991 at an affiliates meeting, when Carson made the announcement that he was actually going to be stepping down from The Tonight Show, the scramble began. And uh, for those of you that I do recommend, uh, it was a made-for-cable made for, made for movie uh, based on a book called The Late Shift. Sort of chronicles the weird sort of tale of what went on between Jay Leno, who had been a frequent guest host and had actually just been named sort of the permanent guest host on the show, and David Letterman, who of course had had a show on NBC, the particular show, his late-night show since the mid-'80s, uh, following Carson's show, and uh, who, would, who would actually take over in Carson's role. Most people had presumed for a very long period of time, I think including Carson himself, uh, that Letterman was the presumed heir to the show, and in fact Carson's production company was involved in the production of Letterman's show. And so when things worked out differently, uh, such that Letterman did not move into the spot, and ultimately it was given to Leno, uh, a whole lot of things ensued from that. And so we'll talk a little bit about what actually happened, sort of doing a little bit of this setting up the historical what did, but then we'll slide over in to the historical what if. So in the historical what did, what actually did happen was, of course, Jay Leno was awarded uh, the host position for The Tonight Show, and that left David Letterman, who was still under contract with NBC for his show, The Late Night Show, which followed The Tonight Show, uh, to make the decision to shop around uh, looking for a show uh, slot that would compete directly with uh, The Tonight Show. Again, I do strongly recommend the book, either The Late Shift or the Made for Television movie, if you have the opportunity to see that and sort of chronicling some of what happened there. But as a result of that, what ultimately did come to be was in 1993, Letterman premiered his show on rival network CBS. And so uh, his show, uh, uh, The Late Show, uh, with David Letterman, then went on to compete directly head-to-head -head with The Tonight Show. And for those of you that know Letterman's biography and know something about certainly the interviews that he's given over the years, the relationship and the admiration that he had for Carson and how much he actually desired. It was sort of his ultimate uh, mission in life was to actually host The Tonight Show. So the loss of The Tonight Show for him uh, was a pretty big blow. And something that obviously uh, had a psychological effect. You can certainly see that in interviews and discussions that have taken place over the last couple of decades talking about this particular thing. But the launch of the rival show on CBS was actually to some acclaim and to some success. In fact, early on, Letterman's ratings for his late show uh, topped those of The Tonight Show now under uh, Jay Leno. And so what happened after that, of course, was now that the, the door had been opened with Carson's retirement and a change at uh, at the Tonight Show. <laughs> it's hard not to, to not to mix up the titles of some of these things. The Tonight Show, The Late Show, The Late Late Show, um, uh, Late Night, uh, because they're all so similar but yet so different. So I'll try not to make a mistake there. Uh, but what actually happened was the realization by a number of networks, and this is also in the period of time when syndication uh, has come into being more as well as the expansion of the cable channel universe. So there's more channels, satellite television is coming into being, and so there's more opportunity for programming options that weren't just on the major networks and gaining traction. So cer certainly once the networks, both the major broadcast networks as well as the cable networks, saw that there was the possibility with, uh, with Carson's departure of competing in that late night space, um, there was, there was a large number of shows that premiered. Uh, Arsenio Hall had been in syndication, although his show quickly uh, lost some of its audience and, and lost some of its ability to get placement after uh, Letterman premiered The Late Show in, in 1993 on CBS. But then there were others as well that, that came into the fray. Uh, Chevy Chase for a period of time. There had been the previous uh, situations where there had been a lack of success by Joan Rivers and other, others as well. And so this opened up the door for having a variety of shows that would compete in that space on a variety of networks and a variety of times. Eventually, uh, there would be the creation of additional shows to follow the traditional late night talk shows. For example, there would be late the Late Late Show on CBS that was uh, produced to follow uh, Letterman's show uh, to compete with the Tonight Show's follow-up 
which was um, was still the uh, was was still late night. And then, of course, about this time, you also have entering the fray uh, networks like Comedy Central, uh, who had picked up um, who had started their show, The Daily Show, uh, originally hosted by Craig Kilborn, that was eventually taken over by John Stewart. Uh, that spawned another show following that, The Colbert Report. And all these are important because many of these same players, for example, eventually uh, Stephen Colbert will take over as the replacement for Letterman uh, following his retirement just within the last few years. And so what you had as a result of Letterman not being given The Tonight Show is you had an explosion of late night talk shows that we still see today. And so many of the folks that are there, uh, we could literally obviously spend a whole podcast episode just on the history of this, but Conan O'Brien, Jimmy Fallon, uh, eventually Jimmy Kimmel on ABC, all of this flows from the fact that there was this explosion, this out, outgrowth, tremendous outgrowth over a period of time in the late night talk show genre. But today we want to focus on the historical what if of what would have happened if Letterman had taken over for The Tonight Show. And my premise and my argument is eventually that we would have had a lot more shows in the late night talk show genre that would eventually have formed. They would have formed in different ways. For example, The Daily Show under Jon Stewart, a 30-minute show that focused a lot on uh, commentary, uh, political commentary particularly, and then normally one guest, maybe two guests at most, was similar but also a different format. So I think you would have still had, just because there was there's plenty of space to be filled in our television universe now with the number of channels, the number of networks that exist, uh, that you certainly would have seen other entrants into this particular thing or, or programming like it. But that was not quite the case where things stood in the early 1990s. And again, at that time, you're coming to the end of a period of time where NBC has owned that time slot, uh, the after the late local news time slot, uh, for a long period of time and sort of owned the genre. Other challengers to the genre had fallen far short of achieving the results that were there. One of the major networks, for example, ABC, aired a, a, a news show during that same period of time as sort of counter-programming, the Nightline show, which had grown out in the, in the late 1970s out of the Iranian hostage crisis into being a nightly news show, was something that dominated that space, but in a different way for ABC. And so for those that wanted to see a talk show format, to hear a comedy monologue, uh, to see interviews with celebrities or other notable people, there was The Tonight Show. If you wanted an in-depth look into something that was going on in the news, uh, there was Nightline on ABC. Uh, on the CBS networks, there were various, or CBS affiliates, there were various syndication programs, even get some game shows, for example, that aired in that slot. And so for the three major broadcast networks, they had created a diversity of what was happening in the space that wasn't just the same thing being done in a slightly different way by different people, but were sort of entirely different genres of shows. Once Letterman moved in to compete directly with its night show and had success doing so, like I said before, that opened up uh, just an entire plethora of these types of shows that have come to be over the last couple of decades. It's, it's now been been quite a while. Uh, in fact, it's been, well, now that I think about it, it's basically almost been 30 years uh, since this actually happened, if you think that's the period of time that, that Carson was at the helm of The Tonight Show. Once again, so the premise of The Fork in Time is that that did not happen. So my premise and my, my position is that Letterman would have continued uh, in much the same vein that Carson had with a slightly different audience. For example, his audience... Uh, and his, the nature of his show that followed Carson's show were different. And so moving the exact same format of show over that he had, that he had done with Late Night into the Tonight Show format was not likely to happen. In fact, there's been a number of uh, interviews with Letterman where he talks about the fact that he understood what he did in the later slot, played well there and sort of being unique or different from the Tonight Show, but he would have probably carried on the show very much in some of the same vein uh, of the format that Carson had uh, succeeded in and had made famous with bringing in some of the elements uh, from from uh, from uh, from late night again struggling to keep late night late show tonight show all straight in my head even though I know what they all are so I think the argument that I would make is that you would have seen a situation where the status quo of 1992 NBC in sole dominance from the talk show perspective of the after the evening news format would have continued for some amount of time with Letterman simply taking over uh, the helm, uh, 
uh, picking up the ball and running with it in such a way that it would have been very difficult for a rival network to necessarily launch something that would be a rival to The Tonight Show. Others might argue that there still might have been uh, competition and explosion in the space. For example, now imagining that the opposite would have happened in terms of uh, the 1992 and 1993 time frame. So now imagine that Letterman uh, takes over as host of The Tonight Show. Leno, uh, sort of feeling jilted because of his recent uh, uh, nomination or position as the permanent guest host and looking to, to have a show of his own, might have been approached by or might have approached CBS uh, where Letterman eventually landed and created The Late Show, but that Leno might have gone to try to launch a competitor to The Tonight Show on CBS. I think that that's a reasonable assumption. I can certainly imagine that happening because CBS was, uh, Les Moonves was very interested in br bringing CBS into that particular genre and having something in that particular time slot that was coming from the network level. Uh, they had tried it again before uh, in, in the 80s with the, the Pat Sajak show. The difference there that, that jumps out to me is it, it's easy to forget sort of what the dynamics were of CBS being able to launch The Late Show with Letterman versus what it would have been like to launch a similar show, we'll call it The Late Show again, with Leno. And the reason for that was not that Leno was not popular, the reason for that was not that Leno did not have a following, but that in some ways what benefited the launch of the CBS Late Show with Letterman was the controversy that had risen as a result of Leno being awarded The Tonight Show. Uh, it became something because <laughs> Letterman still had a show on NBC and still had the ability to exercise a editorial control. It was an interesting period of time when on the same network that he was soon to be leaving, Letterman was still producing a show and a topic of discussion or a topic of many of his bits or some of his conversation was actually around how he had been quote-unquote treated by the very network that his show was airing on. However, it was in NBC's best interest and they were contractually obligated to do so to continue to air that show. So it was this strange sort of weird situation where CBS was ultimately going to be the beneficiary of what had happened on its rival network, NBC, and the personality that was moving from that rival network to launch a show on their network. And so, uh, you know, they, they say about publicity that as long as you spell the name right, all of it's good, right? Is that the actual controversy surrounding that, uh, the fact that it was going to set up a ratings battle, the fact that there were those who felt that Letterman had been treated unfairly, uh, I can remember being during that particular time, and I should confess here that I am much more a Letterman fan than a Leno fan, although I can appreciate Leno, is that uh, there were those who sort of were in one camp or the other. And so it had an energized television viewing marketplace that was already built in. Now we get to the fall of 1993 and CBS's launch of the show. It was a very successful launch, and in fact, for uh, most of the early tenure of The Late Show, actually for a year plus there, it actually had superior ratings to The Tonight Show, which when you imagine where things stood in 1991 when Carson announced his retirement to where things stood by 1993, just two years later, and how much NBC had lost in terms of its control of that spot because of the way that events had, had happened, is sort of an interesting thing to think about. And of course, when others saw the success uh, that Letterman was able to have early on and at least have sustainable ratings, which had not necessarily happened with any other competing show. As I mentioned before, there was suddenly the launch of a number of different shows that went on, and uh, there, there was now a number of competitors that were in the late-night talk show genre. But again, the fork here is imagining that Letterman had never uh, launched his rival show because he had taken over as the Tonight Show host. So imagining that Leno tries to launch a show or that CBS tries to launch a show with Leno at the helm, I think it is possible that it could have had some success. Certainly, he had a presence in the marketplace and there were those that were familiar with him from his role in guest hosting and appearing very frequently on The Tonight Show, actually very frequently appearing on Letterman's show as a guest, uh, the two of them having been friends and, as I understand now, have somewhat restored that relationship. But I don't think it would have been anywhere close to the same amount of additional publicity and interest that was created because of Letterman being pushed out and starting on a rival network. It simply would have been Leno starting a show on a rival network. And while I think that that possibly could have succeeded, 
it would not have been as successful as Letterman's debut on CBS was. And it's interesting then to that point to speculate whether CBS would have stuck with the format. My inclination is they would have. And eventually over time, Leno would have built his audience there. Or uh, whether they would have eventually once again scrapped their efforts to do so. Or that Leno might have found himself going to a rival network. Certainly we found later, for example, after Conan O'Brien had taken over with Leno's departure. And then there was a change back. A whole other interesting story as Leno moved to primetime and then actually moved back to late night, is that eventually Conan O'Brien, who had come in to replace Leno, eventually took his show to a cable network, to TBS, and had success there. And then, of course, eventually, when Letterman departs, a cable TV talk show host, although it was uh, also a comedy-driven and satirical-driven show in many ways, uh, that would be the Colbert Report on Comedy Central when Stephen Colbert comes to take back over Letterman's spot. It's also a very different thing because he brought something that had been created because he, he was a person that eventually flows from the tree of having been created uh, because of Letterman's departure from being under the NBC brand. At least that's the way that I would argue it. And so again, it, to me, it's this interesting concept of what would have happened moving forward with Letterman at the Tonight Show helm is I think you would have seen a much slower development of rival shows, both on broadcast network television, CBS, and then you would have seen, I think, very definitely, because it was already out there in the space, uh, the launch of rival cable shows, but by the very nature of being cable shows and the, the difficulty that exists in cross-promoting them during your primetime lineups on broadcast television, they would have had a much slower growth trajectory. So I think we would find ourselves here in 2021 with still a variety of shows that can be watched in the in the late night space, but nowhere close to what we would see today. Certainly, I think it's also uh, certainly a good argument to make that many of the personalities that we know now that are in the late night space uh, might not be there. If you wait longer, the timing would have been different. Who was where, who was working on what, what they were working on, that type of thing. Uh, you may not have had the same folks come to prominence. Not saying there would not be talented folks that are leading uh, late night talk show hosts of various types and various genres on various networks, but it might not be the same folks. Uh, you might see a Jimmy Fallon that was still known more as being a movie actor and someone on Saturday Night Live. Uh, you may have seen Conan O'Brien, again, now one of Letterman's primary writers. Maybe he takes over for a Letterman when he leaves The Tonight Show, but he never goes off to be the host of The Tonight Show on his own separately, uh, competing with Letterman, and he never goes off to host a show on a rival network. Uh, whether something like Jon Stewart's uh, version of The Daily Show on Comedy Central uh, could have risen to the same level of prominence, I think is an open question and an interesting thing to consider in the sense of it had the advantage in the real timeline of being in that fractured late night universe that had been created in 1993. Uh, would it have risen to the top or risen as a different genre because of its, it being hosted on Comedy Central and taking a different take? I think the answer is yes. I should also readily admit here I'm a fan of Jon Stewart's Daily Show and a lot of the things that were done there and that have been carried forward with other types of shows since then, but it would have functioned in a very different environment. So the point, I think, of this historical what-if is not would we not have a different landscape in late-night TV, not would we have other personalities, but it's just it would have changed the timing in a number of different ways, and it would have been an interesting thing uh, to think through. To me, one of the more interesting things in terms of its, of its potential impact on, um, on broadcast television, late-night broadcast television in the United States, is thinking about the ABC phenomenon is that ABC had a, had a situation with Nightline, which was a highly rated show, again, in the news genre, that had, had functioned very well and had actually managed to do some shifting with changes of host there, but it was a very different type of thing in terms of being compared to a talk show like uh, The Tonight Show. However, even ABC, eventually bringing Jimmy Kimmel into the mix, uh, got into the late-night business by premiering Kimmel's show after... Uh, nightline. And so there was such a desire and feeling like there was such a need in terms of ABC needing to be part of this late night talk show mix uh, that they brought the genre into play. They didn't displace their late night news broadcast or news program in the form of Nightline, but they still brought a talk show host into play 
It was just after that particular thing. So to me, one of the more interesting things also to think about on this historical what if, the fork here is, again, if you don't have the proliferation of, uh, of, of talk shows in the late night genre, what other things might also have proliferated? Could there have been, for example, a rival news show? Nightline was starting to lose some of its clout, some of its ratings, uh, eventually as it loses uh, Koppel as its regular host, as it goes through more of a rotating series of, of, uh, of news anchors and others and reporters who hosted the show, it would be interesting to see if perhaps something along the lines of a show that was more political. Eventually, for example, uh, there was a Politically Incorrect, which moved from HBO uh, to a broadcast network and was certainly more focused on political commentary. Yes, comedy associated with the political commentary, but certainly being more news and politically focused uh, than the traditional late-night talk show genre. I mean, it is interesting when you actually think back to it that one of the things that Carson sort of brought to that genre was the monologue, and very often there were comments about political topics or news items that were built into the monologue, but they were sort of more in the mainstream, sort of center-safe space of, of political commentary because uh, it was his effort not to be overtly political, only to use current events, current political topics of the day, literally of the day in many cases, uh, in the environment of, uh, of comedy. Uh, but it would have been an interesting thing to see if you didn't have um, the proliferation, again, of the regular format, uh, because Letterman takes over The Tonight Show and there is no late show with Letterman, uh, that sort of blows open the landscape. I think it's an interesting thing to think about what other things might have come into the space. For example, when you look at the success, again, of The Daily Show under Jon Stewart, yes, it's comedy-specific, but it's also very politically charged and current event charged. And it found an audience, mainly a younger audience, but it definitely found an audience. And so it's interesting to think, could a show like that have actually come in and taken more of a position, probably not on a broadcast network, but in a different environment where there wasn't as much competition in the regular genre. I know it sounds sort of contradictory because I said, for example, the success of Jon Stewart's version of The Daily Show sort of comes as a result of Letterman leaving, going to CBS, and, and, and the, the market being blow, blown open, if you will. But at the same time, I do wonder about what other types or formats of shows might have found traction if everybody wasn't looking for their version of CBS's Late Show uh, because of the success that Letterman had going up against The Tonight Show. And so to me, to me it's an interesting sort of, um, sort of two sides of the same coin. Would you have seen more of what we eventually saw because of what happened in the real timeline? Or if you had changed the, the timeline, would you have seen different things happen sooner that did eventually happen in the real timeline, but they could have happened sooner if there had been a different marketplace out there? I think it's interesting to think about what might have happened if CBS, again, as I mentioned before, had decided to launch a competitive news or political show opposite The Tonight Show, again, more competing with Nightline than The Tonight Show, with the idea of just looking at counter-programming. Counter Certainly it was the case of even when The Tonight Show was in its heyday, there were folks who tuned to Nightline who did not tune to The Tonight Show, and there were folks that tuned to the night show that, that did not tune to Nightline because they were just two very different genres of shows. And so, again, part, part of the irony for me is thinking back on if Letterman had, in fact, taken over for The Tonight Show, would we have actually had more diversity in what's out there in terms of different styles and types of shows, particularly on the broadcast networks, than we do today? The current reality here in 2021 is immediately following the late night news, the late local news in the United States for the three, for three of the major broadcast networks. That dynamic has changed now uh, because of the uh, because of, of cable and just because of the, the again the explosion of the number of channels and the number of networks. But on ABC, NBC, and CBS, what happens after the late local news is exactly the same general type of show. The Tonight Show on NBC, The Late Show on CBS, and uh, the Jimmy Fallon, I'm sorry, not Jimmy Fallon, but uh, Jimmy Kimmel's show on ABC. Uh, we don't have diversity. We have a diversity of hosts, but we don't have a diversity of genres. 
And so to me, one of the more interesting things potentially about this historical what if, the fork, which all goes back to Letterman, if he had taken over for The Tonight Show, is I think we might see a slightly different composition of what's there. And that doesn't even get into the shows that exist on cable or the other alternatives that exist at that time. So, did the, uh, did the succession plan at The Tonight Show change history in a major way? The answer is obviously no. But did it change the landscape of American television, particularly late night television? The answer is yes. Uh, things are very different now in my mind than they would have been if there had been the simple transition from Carson to Letterman. And whether the current environment is better or worse, I think that's probably just in the eye of the beholder. Certainly one of the things that has happened is that we have a number of different personalities that have come forth and a number of different styles that have come forth in terms of the hosting of those shows, the comedy that's associated with those shows. And for me, as someone who views those shows, I enjoy those. Uh, I can enjoy Leno and I can enjoy Letterman and how they're similar. I can also enjoy how they're different. Uh, certainly uh, Colbert and Fallon and Kimmel all bring unique things to the genre as well. And so in that sense, at least in terms of what I would call mainstream <laughs> humor uh, that we see on a regular basis that's expressed through uh, the late night talk show genre, uh, we have a, the diversity I think is a good thing. Uh, again, and that holds nothing back or says nothing about the fact that uh, I will unabashedly say that Letterman is one of my all-time favorites. I go all the way back to late night with him on, on NBC back when I was in college and watching that, staying up later than I should, probably when I should have been studying uh, to watch uh, either you know, a stupid pet trick or to see where he had sent Larry Bud Melman off to, for those of you that know those references. So again, I thank you for joining us here today on A Fork in Time. No, this was not a serious episode and may not be something that is, is life-altering and life-changing for you, but every once in a while we just like to look at some other types of historical what-ifs and think about how they would have uh, resonated through history. And it doesn't always have to be about somebody getting shot. It doesn't have to be about a war. It doesn't have to be about the major shifts in history. Sometimes the minor shifts or the social things are interesting and fun things to follow. So we thank you for indulging us today as we do something a little bit lighter. And we'll be back next week, obviously, with something that probably for, falls more traditionally in the line of alternate history in the sense of maybe qualifying for some of you as history while this doesn't. As always, I want to thank you for being a listener. I want to invite you to visit our webpage at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. All kinds of things you can do there, topic suggestions, leaving us feedback, uh, supporting the show through links to our social media as well as via our Patreon page if you'd like to provide financial support to the show. Just all the things that are there, including the complete back library. And so we just invite you to, to visit www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Uh, certainly, if you're new to the show here and you like it, tell somebody about it. Uh, share word of mouth and social media is still a great way for us to also get the word out as well. But closing out the show for today, for now, this is Don, hoping that you join us next time on A Fork in Time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.